Uh, my name is Hans Verkauw. I have been involved in the video for Linux subsystem for 14 years or so by now. I used to do uh, about every year a status report during the ELC. I uh, haven't done it in the last several years, so I was, thought it was time to do another one. What is new is also CEC, Consumer Electronics Control. That's a brand new subsystem, and that will be the second half. So this is a two-parter. The first half is video for Linux. The second half is the status of CEC. Uh, depending on the time, I, may ha I might have questions after the first half, or I will postpone it until the end. We will see how it goes. So first, video for Linux. Um, Start with the boring bit, but if you have that hardware, it's very interesting, uh, of course. So there are since uh, several, this is, I'm going back several years now, so in the last several years, we have a whole bunch of new video for Linux drivers. Uh, Renesas for their R-Car automotive platform, they are, they are doing very, very well. There are lots of support for those is, uh, is in, uh, in the kernel. Texas Instruments for various chips for the video capture uh, codec parts. Uh, same thing for Texas Instruments, they're in the automotive business. Atmel, uh, Samsung has done a lot of work for the codec supports in their Exynos chips. You, you probably want, it's fairly unlikely that we will see camera support for Exynos 5 and up due to the way they designed their hardware and firmware. It is unlikely that we will ever see something for that in the kernel. Uh, MediaTek, very interesting. They started to be active in about the last year, year and a half, and they have really do, been doing a good job. So this, this driver for this codec came from MediaTek, was developed by MediaTek themselves, and it's very good quality. I was pleasantly surprised by that. Uh, ST Microelectronics has been developing quite a few codec drivers as well. What is interesting about this list is first of all the absence of, um, is mostly that these companies are interested, especially Renaissance and TI, in the automotive business. So I'm seeing, a, so this is my own opinion, this may be completely wrong, but I'm seeing a shift in how companies deal with, with video, with codecs and camera input. In the past, they used to have SOC vendors used to have a few big customers, so they would take millions of, of chips from them, and, but there were only a few customers making smartphones. And the life cycles were very short, so while we would have loved to see upstream support, they basically were continually in, in the, you know, we have a next model coming up in a year and we have to develop for that, so we have absolutely no time or interest in going upstream, because it frankly doesn't, we don't get any benefits. Um, we now see a shift in the industry going for two reasons. One is automotive. The main difference between smartphones is your car, you don't throw it away after a year or two. So the support for <coughs> software in cars has, to, has a much longer life cycle and you need security fixes. So there is much more interest in getting things upstream because now it starts to make sense. The other industry shift is that of the Internet of Things, where instead of having, with smartphones, you have only a few big customers. With Internet of Things, you have lots of small ones. So with the smartphone business, they can put in support teams for just those customers. You cannot do that for Internet of Things. The only way to scale is to get things upstream using a standardized API that is easy to use and you don't have to support them. And if it's upstream, they can get automatically security fixes by just upgrading to the new kernel. So I see a shift in the industry and I see a lot more interest in actually getting things upstream. Um, for the past one, two years, the, the main focus seems to have been on codecs. I am uncertain how much we will see for camera ISPs. Uh, a lot of companies like to keep that secret for one reason or, or, or another. So how that will work out, I'm not sure. We will see how, what the future will, will bring in that respect. We might perhaps see fairly limited implementations, so you won't have the full ISP functionality, but you can get, say, the raw data from the sensor and you can do your own processing in a GPU if you want, but then it's up to you. So the, 
we will have to wait and see what will happen. This is basically what I see right now. Let me go to the next slide because that is interesting. Where uh, the Qualcomm, this is for example, there's a driver being developed for the Qualcomm camera system, but that is a very limited implementation. So you can get data from the camera, but you won't have access to the full ISP. But you can process it yourself if you want. Uh, other things that are upcoming, Freescale. So the Freescale has always had a video for Linux implementation, which was frankly horrendous. They managed to pick an API for sensors that was in the kernel for only, I think, two or three releases before it was deprecated and removed. So every sensor drive they made is completely incompatible with anything that we have today. And frankly, the driver source is it's really, really, really bad. So a consultant came up and they actually two, two competing implementations we had, but one is now being picked and is close to being staging. They did a great work for having almost full functionality, I think, for the Freescale SOC when it comes to the ISP and, and all the blocks that are in there. So I'm very hopeful that this will go in in staging for 4.12 or 4.13. I, I'm, I'm pushing it a bit. I really like to get this in as soon as possible, even if it's in staging. Because Freescale, it sees a lot of traction, a lot of people use it. So this would be really nice. Uh, for Qualcomm, again, this comes from consultants, not yet from Qualcomm themselves, unfortunately. Uh, again, I'm with the shift in industry. This might change, but for now, it's been limited to consultants who ditch. They look at the code and ditch it and write something proper themselves. Uh, Synopsys is uh, trying to get a CSI2 driver in here. I'm waiting for the next version for that to be posted. And recently I learned that uh, a Raspberry Pi 3 implementation was added and it's in, apparently in staging for 4.11. I haven't seen it yet, but that's what I, uh, what I heard. So again, that will be very nice to have. Raspberry Pi, it's really, I know there was a video for Linux implementation out there, but it was never upstream. So seeing this upstream will be very beneficial for lots of people, I think, given the popularity of the Raspberry Pi. So that is, that is what we have been seeing in the form of drivers, and especially the last year, a lot of new drivers were posted. And I hope that this will continue in the, in the coming year. So uh, another thing we've been involved in are, of course, core activities, core functionality that needs to be improved, needs to be changed. And the one thing that I'm working on is removing the SOC camera framework. Now, for those who don't know, SOC camera framework in, in the video for Linux subsystem was a framework added quite a long time ago when we didn't have the full, full fledged functionality that we have today to handle complex hardware. And it was basically for very simple SOC pipelines. And as a sensor uh, output goes into the SOC and you have a DMA engine. Perhaps a little bit of processing, but it's very limited. So very short, very simple pipelines. The problem that we had with that framework is that sensor drivers needed to be written specifically for that framework. So they were incompatible if you wanted to use it with the regular video for Linux framework. So you could have duplicate drivers or you have painful, you wanted to use an SOC sensor, but you use it with another SOC that didn't, wasn't based on SOC camera and you couldn't do that. So we have done a lot of work in trying to convert existing SOC drivers to the regular model. And there is now only one, there are two left. One is very close to being moved out. And then the remaining one is, for various reasons, next to impossible to convert. So we will just merge the SOC camera framework into that driver and make it impossible to be used by anyone else. SOC camera has been a, a real big pain point because of the incompatibilities that it introduces, so it would be really nice when it is finally removed. Um, another thing we've been struggling with is ref counting and lifetime management. So you have, if you have a complex pipeline, you have lots of objects, lots of devices, and they all work together. 
but when, for whatever reason, you either unbind or unplug something, or in an FPGA, you may remove a, uh, dynamically remove a block, then you need to make sure that the right things, that, that memory sticks around until the last ref count goes away. And lifetime management turned out to be really complicated. In 99% in of the cases, everything works fine. You never notice. But when you, for example, unbind, forcibly unbind a subdevice, a sensor, chances are everything will crash, especially if you're streaming at that point. So we've been looking into improving that, and work is being done on getting this done the right way. But that really requires some very low level changes in the framework to have the right ref counting and locking in place. Um, but it would be good to have this. Um, while doing this, one interesting thing that I was not aware of for a long time is DevM K malloc and Kevin DevM KZ malloc and, and friends. It turned out that if you allocate memory for a device like this, it will be re released as soon as you unbind that device. But if others still depend on it, there's, there's no ref counting involved. So you unbind the device, anything allocated with DevM K malloc for that device is immediately released, freed. So this causes lots of issues and in practice, you, if you have a hot pluggable device, you really cannot use DevM K malloc. You can do that with clocks and other hardware resources because once it is removed, you can't use them anyway, so it doesn't make sense that they disappear, but memory, you typically should not use that. Unfortunately, we're using this in quite a few places because we were not aware of it. Um, but this needs to be fixed as well. I'm just mentioning it here because I didn't know. I thought it was ref counted. So when the, uh, when the last reference to the device struct itself would go away, only then would the memory be released. But that's not the case. It is released as soon as the remove call is called. So this is not ref counted, and that's not I did not expect that. Uh, another very big part that we're working on, uh, well, Laurent Pinchard specifically, is the request API and stateless codec support. Now, this needs a bit of explanation. Request API basically comes for the Android HAL support, Android camera support. What they do is for every frame, that they submit to, to capture, you can associate settings, controls, like setting the right gain, setting the right white balance values, whatever, and they need to be synchronized. So when you capture to that, that buffer, the same before you do that, those controls need to be applied at the right time. So you have per frame configuration. We do not have that today in the kernel. We've been working on this for a long time, and the first patch series should have been there end of December, and then it was end of January, and it's still not there, and I'm, we are, need to figure that out, how to get something upstream. So this is actually fairly complex. It's a fairly big change. Uh, but we can, uh, if all goes well, we can really control everything on a per-frame basis. So not just controls like gain, but also dynamically changing resolution or formats or even, even the, the pipeline, the video pipeline, you might change on the fly. Because that is what Android expects you to be able to do, so we need to do that as well. Uh, the other reason for the request API has to do with stateless codecs. So codecs, you know, H.264, H.265, MPEG, they, the ones we have in the kernel today, there are stateful codecs, so the hardware will remember the state. You provide it with a raw frame for an encoder, and the internal state will remember whether it should be encoded as an I-frame or a P-frame or whatever, and it keeps track of that over the lifetime. A stateless codec offloads that to the CPU. So when you pass in a frame, you not only have to pass in the frame, but also the current state. And when you get the encoded frame back, you also get the updated state or you have to do that yourself. I'm not sure how that works exactly on the low level. But that means that it is, it is again, it's per frame configuration because you have to pass in not just a frame but also lots of information to the hardware. 
So the request API and stateless codec support, they go hand in hand. You need, you need the request API in order to implement the stateless codec. An early version of the request API is currently being used for several years now by Chrome OS. So they have a number of Video Linux stateless codec drivers. And they've just been carrying that patch series, uh, but they really would like to see this support getting upstream so they can also upstream those drivers. Uh, at 10, there is a session by Laurent Pinchard about exactly this topic, stateless codec drivers. So if you're interested, I pitch this talk to you to go there because you should get a lot more in-depth information. Uh, another thing we've been working on, we have a media controller. For those who do not know, the media controller is an API that exposes the topology of your hardware. So it will show a sensor, a DMA engine, various uh, video devices and how they are all hooked together. Uh, this is extended, has been extended to cover also DVB. And uh, there, we also would like to see that for ALSA, but that is very uncertain at this moment. I'm not sure what the status is. And also the CEC, the new, new stuff that I've been making. I will talk about that a little more. Uh, CEC will definitely happen because you need that. The main problem we have right now for the media controller is that we need better documentation, better compliance tests, better utilities. There is too much that's uh, fuzzy. If you want to implement this, there are too many things that are a bit, should I do it that way, should I do it that way? The documentation isn't precise enough. And I really would like to work on that. My problem is getting time. Um, I will try to get more time, but I can't guarantee that they actually can get it. But this is, I think, the main blocking thing with the media controller that is just, it's 90% there, but it's just missing the final covering the corner cases, good documentation, all the little things you need in order to make a nice API a really good API that is actually people can easily use. What I also see that a lot of drivers that use this, they tend to do the same thing. And that needs to be refactored into helper functions so that it's a lot easier to work with the media controller. Uh, so this is an example for uh, the media topology for a USB uh, video of Linux and DVB stick. It's, a, it's cheap hardware, but uh, what, what you see here is fairly complicated. So there are lots of things going on. Let me see if I... So the, the yellow boxes, they are all the actual device nodes. So this is what applications will open and then issue IOCTOS to and do the, do the right things. What has been new, newly added to the media controller are the orange um, lines that indicate what that device node actually controls. So in this case, uh, let me see. This one controls the tuner, so it can be used to set the right frequency, etc. And the demodulator, so it can program that as well for the various protocols. Uh, the other blocks, so the dark blue ones are connectors. The support for that is in progress, let me put it that way. So this is a television input, and we have S-video and composite inputs. And the light blue ones are sub-devices, so we have a tuner, a demodulator, um, audio TV, uh, the TV decoder, and an MPEG transport stream demuxer. And uh, these, what's that, green, whatever. These are the DMA engines that actually produce, copy the, the internal data into memory. The blue lines indicate how the data flows. Now there are, there are some little things that are, so for example you have, you have in the unknown error type, really that needs to be a proper type. So there, there are lots of things that need to be improved here. To, that, those, that final 10%, we really need to tackle that and that cost, that takes time. And we really do not have that enough at the moment. 
I think this is one of the bigger blocking issues to make that, that people, that needs to be sorted out. Uh, other things that are in progress, uh, I really hope this year that we will get a virtual codec driver. So we are a big, we, we love our virtual drivers. We have a Vivid driver, which is a virtual video capture driver. It emulates a sensor, uh, TV inputs, uh, S-video input and an HDMI input. And it works brilliantly. It's ideal for testing your application. It's ideal for us to test the APIs and you can run it without having HDMI capture hardware, and you can test your application with that. It's, it's very, very nice. We do have a simple virtual memory-to-memory -memory device driver. So memory-to-memory -memory means you give it a frame, it's processed, you get it back. So it's for codecs, for scalars, the interlacers, any processing block that does something with video and DMAs it back to memory. We have a very simple virtual memory-to-memory -memory test driver, but what we really would like to have is a virtual codec driver, so we can emulate the way codecs behave. And ideally, we can switch between a stateful codec and a stateless codec, and applications can then check their API towards a codec like that, see if they all do the right things. Um, I worked with a student, Tom aan de Wiel, and as part of his university studies, he did a project for me, figuring out what would be a good nice codec to get into the kernel. So it had to be patent free, it had to be simple. You don't want an H.264 encoder into the kernel, that's not a good idea. So it had to be simple, fast, uh, patent free. And he found a very nice one. Um, hopefully he will have time to turn it into a real driver. If not, I will probably take it on. And it would really help developing and checking the API and making good compliance tests for codecs. Uh, another thing I've been working on, um, I do a lot of, I'm specializing in HDMI receivers and transmitters, and as part of that, the EDID is very important. It's a very important part of the whole protocol, so that's the display, extended display information. What's the last D definition? I'm not sure. It tells you what the properties are of the display. And uh, the EDID decode utility is part of X Windows uh, utility suite, but it is, was fairly out of date, and I've been doing a lot of work in updating it. One of the things I still need to do is upstream it. So it has now support for the latest HDMI 2.0 standards and lots of extra checks so that it can verify whether the EDID that you make yourself is actually according to the specification, and it will warn if it's not. And for the same reason, you can, you, know, you can hook up a display and check the EDID of the display, whether it's correct or whether it's anything weird. So it's a very nice uh, piece of work and um, has been very useful for us to, to debug issues with displays. So I really need to spend some time in getting this stuff upstream. Another utility I've been working on, QVidCap, is one where you can, it's similar to QVidCap 2 that already exists. But this is much simpler. It just be, it allows you to capture from a device node and it will just show the image. What is nice about it is that on the fly you can change formats, you can scale. Uh, so this is specifically useful for prototyping when you want to bring up a new board. You think you are getting one format from the hardware, but it turns out not to be the correct one. And then you can just try various combinations and see, okay, what is going wrong? Perhaps this wasn't interleaved, but it was planar, or uh, was it YUV, YUYV, or was it uh, UYVY, or what order actually do I get the stuff? You can, you can all do that interactively. It's, it's close to being ready, but it's not quite there yet. What is also nice is that with the command line utility V4L2CTL, you can actually if you install that on your box that you have, that you're trying to bring up, you can stream the data, the video that you capture to a PC where QVidCap is running. So you don't need to have a full HDMI output and full uh, display support and applications running on the system. You can just stream it through the internet, through Ethernet to a PC and watch it there. Very useful in early stages of board bring up. 
So one of the big problems we have, video is complicated, so there are not that many people who know really all the ins and outs, and we really could do with more work, with more people. Uh, if you are involved as a company with video, and you use video for Linux a lot, think about giving back, and that's specifically time. I would love to have more code reviewers, people who are willing to dig into the core stuff, uh, if, you are, if you get involved in that, the nice thing about it is that you can also control it to some extent. You can control the direction things are going. If you, as a company, have certain features you want, get involved. You know, if you, if you implement the support for that, for that feature, you know it will work for your hardware, because you did it yourself. So we would really like to get more people for the long term involved in this. And to give an example how I do that with Cisco, my Mondays and Fridays are completely for video for Linux. I don't, I try not to do anything else. Does it always work out? But really you need to, if, if this should work, you need to make good agreements with your manager that these days I'm not working on the products, I'm working on this long-term support for video for Linux. Uh, that works best. But you need, to, you need to make sure that you're not pulled off for the next customer emergency. You have those other three days for that. This works for me very well. Not always, especially the last, we, had, we were very busy as well the last several months, and it, I admit it was interfering with my video for Linux work, but I really try to limit that as much as possible. If you're interested, Go to Mauro Chahab, the, the media subsystem maintainer, or to me, or the mailing list. I would really like to get more people involved, because this is important, and we are just, uh, as more drivers pop up and more things need to be done, we are running out of people to work on it. I think I'll take the questions at the end, given the time. So CEC, um, what is it? Let me start with that. It is, uh, CEC is, I'm, I'm missing, a, oh no, it's the next one. It's a pin on the HDMI connector. It's called consumer electronics control. It's a pin on the HDMI connector and it allows you to control other devices. So the typical use case that you as a consumer will, will see is you have a Blu-ray player, you pop in a, a disc and the TV automatically goes on. Uh, it starts playing and you can use the TV remote to also control the, 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 the Blu-ray player or vice versa. That's all done through CEC. It's a ridiculously slow um, uh, protocol with 400 bits, bits, not bytes, bits per second. So even the new Horizons probe, well beyond Horizon, uh, well, well beyond uh, Pluto, it is faster than CEC at one meter. Latency sucks for the Pluto probe, but the speed is a lot better than this. Uh, what you typically have here, you have a, a physical address that is given to you by the display in the EDID, and you have a logical address. The logical address is really a nickname. So it's not, you know, when I first started in CEC, I was thinking that this was some, some special, like an IP address, it has nothing to do with that, it's really a nickname. You have a TV, you have a playback device, you have a tuner, you have a few, tip, a few different things that you can be, and you allocate yourself a logical address, or you allocate a nickname. It's like, like IRC, you know, you want a nickname, and if, if you are locked in somewhere else under the same nickname, you get a, a, a variant of that nickname. It's sort of similar to that. It's an optional feature to HDMI, so you don't have to implement it, but a lot of consumer electronics these days will have it. It provides high level control functions. It's based on the very old AV, uh, or very old SCART connectors. That's where it first popped up in an earlier incarnation. The protocol has been improved a lot, but for whatever reason, they kept the physical characteristics, so it's just as slow as technology from, I don't know, 20 years ago, which is a bit of a shame. You have CEC in HDMI receivers, in transmitters, and standalone USB dongles like this, where you put in, 
You have an HDMI input and an HDMI output, and through the USB you can control the CEC. This is typically used with graphics cards that do not support CEC, but you still want to communicate with your TV, and that's what these things are used for. Um, data packets, you have a header byte, and then zero to 15 bytes of payload, and very, very slow. I've worked on this for quite some time because Cisco wants to use this a lot more, so this was a good opportunity to make a proper API. Before this, there was, there was CEC support, but not in the mainline kernel, and every vendor did their own little thing. And in 4.8, it was merged in staging, and in 4.10, just released this Sunday, it finally was moved out of staging and is now mainline framework. Uh, Driver for this fairly popular device is included in the kernel. And it's actually working very well. I'm very pleased with it. One of the things that are missing, we want DRM drivers, HDMI transmitters, when they detect a, a new connect event and they read the EDID. The EDID contains the physical address, so that needs to be the, the CEC driver needs to be notified of that new physical address. Uh, Russell King made a notifier framework for this, and it was not quite 100%, so I improved it further, and I'm trying to get this in for 4.12. This is a missing piece that we really need, because it makes it much easier for DRM drivers to just send out a notification, hey, you're disconnected, or hey, this is your new, new physical address, and you can have a separate CEC driver because usually it's a separate IP block that can just receive that notification and then do the right thing. We have two new CC drivers pending. One is for a USB similar to, to this one, a range shadow device. ST Microelectronics has one up and running. Um, the weird thing about CEC, and really annoying actually, is that the protocol, the high level protocol, it is, uh, it can be ambiguous, and more importantly, a lot of vendors do not comply to the spec. Now, the, the reason behind this is, this is again my opinion, my guess, is that the spec can be difficult to figure out, so it's probably just, can well, very well be lack of knowledge, but also there has been, particularly in the beginning, a lot of lock-in, so it only works, your TV, of brand X only works with the Blu-ray player of brand X. So you're for forced, if you want to have this, to buy it of the same brand. It's improving quite a bit, is my impression lately, but there are still um, weird things going on. And also the CEC spec, if you read it, there are lots of corner cases, a lot of special things that you need to do. So it's not like a regular protocol where you just, which is nicely symmetrical and, and systematic. This is more ad hoc and, oh dear, uh, we have lots of people doing this. Well, let's, let's hack support into the spec for this. One very good example that we recently discovered is that if you have a display and you send it into standby or you switch to another input, then, on the, then the hot plug detect will go away. But if the hot plug detect of the display goes low, that means that there is no EDID. So you lose, as a CEC device, you lose your physical address because that's part of the EDID. But you still connect it, and CEC commands still work. So if you want to wake up that display, you still need to be able to send a message. And the CEC 1.4 specification says nothing about this, but in the 2.0, they added in the tiny, tiny notes, they said, well, in this case, you can send a poll message or an image view on or text view on as with this specific logical address, and then it will work as an exception. We only recently discovered that. Uh, actually, what is currently in the 4.10 kernel does not support this yet. I have a patch that I'm working on to fix this. But those are the little annoying uh, corner cases and weird things that are very difficult to figure out if when you start out with CEC, because there are so many of them. And I'm trying to get as much of that into the CEC framework 
so that you, as a driver and application developer, do not have to care about it. And also that it is, that it is properly implemented somewhere. So that brings me to the next step, which are the CEC utilities. Uh, I have three utilities. They are part of the V4L Utils Git repository. CEC CTL is similar to V4L2 CTL, which is just a Swiss army knife. You can configure CEC adapters. You can send any message that you like. You have full coverage of the whole specification. Uh, so you can very easily check all sorts of things using that utility. The next two, the compliance and the follower test. So the follower is sort of, um, we, you, you emulate what should happen in a TV or a playback device. It's emulating, so it can follow messages. It when it receives messages, it will reply with the right things. And if you don't have your own application up and running yet, you can just run this and see how it works when you hook up, say, a display. So you can consider this sort of a reference implementation, how a typical playback device would work in CEC. And you can look at that. It is, it is um, dual license as GPL and BSD. So you just can take that code and incorporate it in your own application as sort of an initial template and then flesh it out for your own specific use case. The other is the compliance test, and that tests a remote device. So you can use that to test how well does my display correspond to the specification. How well does my Blu-ray player that I've hooked up correspond to the specification? Uh, I've continually improving them. They are written with the needs of Cisco in mind. So we typically are playback devices. We advertise ourselves as a playback device or a TV device, depending whether we're a transmitter or receiver. And we've been concentrating on the features that we need. We do have coverage for the other features, but there are very simplistic tests. In no way are they in-depth. So if you are, for example, um, want to test the tuner of a TV, it will do a little bit but it's by no means complete. If you have patches you want to improve it, please do so. Let me, let me post them to me on the mailing list. I would love to improve that part. But since it's not a priority for, for us, it's unlikely that I will do that. So that would really be up to whoever is using it to do that. Uh, it, it is great because this is really ideal for debugging any devices you connect to and see how well they correspond to the spec. And if you're lucky enough to actually be able to talk to the vendor, you can just show, show the basically a checklist of, see, this is what is wrong, and that's what is wrong, and this is not according to the spec. Please fix this. Uh, another thing I've been working on, sadly, I've not been able to test it. For hotels, there is an extension to the CEC spec called the hospitality profile that can drive displays to do things like, you know, when you enter your hotel room, it is on on low volume, very annoying by the way, but those things can be controlled through CEC from a central server. Um, I've implemented in a test version of CEC CTL, I have implemented this, but I've been unable to find a hotel yet that actually does this. If I do, I can hook up this device and just uh, start sending commands and see what happens. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's all coax at the moment and uh, antenna driven, so uh, I've not been able to do anything with that. Love to be able to do that. Uh, one thing that's very nice about this, besides being able to be used as a CEC replacement for graphics cards that do not have it, you can also use this to monitor. So you can just, you have a system with say Blu-ray player and TV, you can put this in the middle, hook it up to a laptop, and monitor all the traffic that's going by. Very, very nice. Ideal for debugging issues. Okay. So some of the resources, uh, media subsystem, main upstream tree, uh, utility, media utilities, including the CEC utilities, Documentation, CC is documented, and you can find it all there, what the public API is. 
and of course my email. I, so I'm for video for Linux, I'm one of the maintainers. For CEC, I'm the only maintainer. So we, Cisco really developed this over the period of two, about two years, I think. And so if you have any questions, any things, just reach out to me and I'd be happy to help. I would really like, uh, like what we have right now. It's much better than what we saw in, uh, in Android trees where it's all vendor specific. So this is working out very well. If you get issues, you find mistakes, whatever, please let me know. Uh, it's also much easier to set up messages, CEC messages, because there is a header that is in the, in the, that's a public header of the kernel, which lots of static inlines. You just call the right function in that, from that header to fill in all the fields of a CEC message. So you don't need to you know, copy all the CEC defines yourself and make it all yourself. It's all part and it's shared between user space and the kernel. So it's all the same for both. And that makes it a central place where all the, it's a central repository of all the knowledge and exceptions and weirdo things in CEC. And I really would like to have that document everything that's weird, corner cases, get as much as possible into the framework. So you, as an application developer, do not have to think about it. And if you want to know if you do the right implementation, you just run the compliance test on your own code, see what happens. Uh, much better, there are compliance tests in commercial products, but they are very expensive. Uh, apparently, none of the, at least TV manufacturers, seems to run it because they are just, you know, the very first thing you test will fail. The spec says if you send a message that you do not support, you should give back a feature aboard. Almost everyone I've tested does not do that. It just silently ignores it. And that's just, you look into the compliance test, official compliance test for CEC, it's pretty much the first test. So apparently nobody is actually running this on their own devices. Uh, but this is cheap, it's free, you have a laptop, all you need is one of these, or uh, if you have an embedded system where CEC is already implemented, you can use that. So it's very easy to do. So, nice time. Questions? Do we have any comments about libcec? Um, should I do that in public? Let me put it this way, it's one megabyte of uh, fairly complicated, uh, overblown CEC code, C++ code. I looked at it, and I didn't like it. And there are also, so this is a user space implementation that is basically, for those who do not know, there's basically a library that has support for vendor-specific CEC APIs and that applications can use to, to handle CEC. Now, there are a few problems with that one. Uh, first is the approach. I can't I mean, let, it's, it's made by the same manufacturer as this dongle, and I can't blame them because, hey, there was no support for CEC in the kernel, so they had no choice. Let me put that up front. I mean, given the situation, I may not like the code, but that they have it makes sense. But uh, this really CEC really belongs into the kernel because you want to be able to be notified when the EDID comes in or disappears and you live with libcec, you need to do that in user space. So you need to read out this, the EDID from your graphics cards and pass it on to libcec. It all has to be done manually. It's, it's not, uh, this really belongs into the kernel. There are various other reasons why it's this should belong in the kernel as well, but this is one of the main ones. And it's much nicer because right now you can configure your CEC adapter. I'm a, I'm a playback device. And the whole claiming of logical addresses is all done by the framework. So you disconnect and you reconnect and it will be automatically be come up again. So it's much easier if this is in the kernel. And I, yeah, I also don't like the code. <laughs> So it's it's tightly controlled. The code is tightly controlled yeah. of libcc. Okay, okay. 
yeah, and with video, with these CC utilities, uh, I happily accept patches if they pass quality control, of course, but uh, I really want to make this a good, good framework with all this, this stuff into, all this knowledge should be reposited into the utilities and into the framework because it's way too complex otherwise. Any other questions? Then thank you very much for turning up at this early hour.